further ado, uh, thank you very much all for coming. Our speaker tonight is Ian Stetler, and I will leave the introductions to Tim Kennedy. Thank you. Our speaker tonight would be considered in some places as a YouTube sensation. When surfing the internet channels, his unique branding style stands out and can be easily identified. So allow me to exhibit a few of these popular styles. The most common popular style that you will see of this person is a B suit like I have here. Usually he'll have some type of a hat and if I can get a suit on. And he's notably known for, for those glasses, okay? And, and he's always standing, looking at the camera somewhere over here, okay? So that's one of his popular styles. The next one, the next style is he always wears a black hat, okay? And with those grown looking eyes that I just find very fascinating. I don't know how he finds the age and everything in those eyes, but that's the style he's got. And most recently, <laughs> this one. Does everybody identify that style? And most of all, I love this. He's even brought his own cup of coffee. But what I love about his statements is he's, a middle of a, he's in the middle of a sentence, and then he goes, and then he continues to, to pontificate. <laughs> Yes, we'll lose the hat here. In these faces, he can be seen musing over bee stuff, ranting over disagreeable actions, and almost pontificating in a good way to the viewer. His branding is so identifiable that before you even read his YouTube channel caption, you know that this is a Canadian beekeeper's blog, which has reached international recognition a very impressive achievement for someone afraid of speaking. So which, which is it that attracts the audience? Is it the recognizable face or the many hats he wears? You decide. Our presenter is a fourth generation farmer of grains, cattle, and beekeeping. He and his, I believe his three brothers, right? Yeah. yeah. He and his three brothers and their families all manage and operate the family corporation near Miami, Manitoba. But our guest was the appointed and the sole willing son to operate the apiary business, which began over 20 years ago, about shortly after he outgrew diapers. That's my understanding. As a University of Manitoba student and a graduate of an agricultural diploma, he and several friends decided to earn two credits, perhaps more like a casual fun and games, easy credits, so he thought, but little did he realize that the school of hard knocks was at his door. Today, he operates over 1,200 hives, and for 15 years, he has been a loyal member of BeeMade, and most recently serves in an executive position with the Manitoba Beekeepers Association. In casual conversation, I inquired, what circumstances guided you to this point in your career? His response, I'm a person who always says no to things particularly of a public nature. I'm afraid of public speaking. Last year, I promised my wife I would stop saying no to requests for volunteering and speaking publicly, and look where it got me. I am now involved with the MBA, hosted a B day on our farm for the RRAA and the MBA, and now I'm here talking to you. I'm considering to start saying no again, but I'm having too much fun. Our guest mentors include people like Randy Oliver, which I understand they are in frequent communication, as well as Murray Lewis. When asked, what is your philosophy in beekeeping, he responded, know what is going on inside the hive. I further asked, sum it all up for me with one statement of your entire beekeeping experience. And he answers, diversity is the key to healthy hives. As a Red River Apiary member, I am and we are so grateful and honored that you have chosen not to say no, but instead chose to join us today and speaking on the topic, sustainable land management and development. Please welcome Ian Stepper. <clears throat>
Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, that introduction kind of rivals yours, Brad, that you gave me last year at the convention. <laughs> so I just want to, uh, I'm just going to keep my jacket on because today is giving me a little bit of a, a chill. So I'll probably take it off after you guys give me a little bit of heat. Um, I just want to start the uh, evening out. Uh, I just want to thank the Red River Abers Association for supporting the, uh, the B-Day that was held at my, uh, my farm. Uh, it was a huge success. Uh, we had uh, $1,500 donated towards the Barry Finkler Fund. That's a research fund of the NBA, which is extremely generous of the crowd. Uh, we had over 150 guests show up, which has really impressed me. And uh, my kids are really happy because there was 25 or 30 kids there. And they, they had a lot of fun entertaining all the kids. Um, and th this is maybe just a little bit self-serving, but uh, one of the purposes of the, uh, of the field day was me uh, as an MBA director. And what, I'm, what I try to do is I, I'm trying to show purpose of the Manitoba Beekeepers Association uh, to the membership. So my vision was to have uh, the membership show up, and you guys pulled that off, and have an MBA member and government show up, because we're, we're your representative to the government. So we had Miles Bolden, he's the primary director of agriculture, very important man to our business. He showed up, he made the time of the day to show up to the meeting, and Blaine Peterson, MLA for Midland, uh, Minister of uh, Growth, Enter Enterprise and Trade, so my vision was to have the NBA stand up holding a frame of bees with uh, the government as representative. So I got my picture and my day was happy after that. <laughs> so I thank you all for that. And also, uh, our bee name was spread across all Manitoba, and specifically with bees on my face. <laughs> so I won't, be, uh, I won't be growing a bee beard anytime soon. But hey, do we have a clicker? Just have to get the keyboard. Oh, okay. the keyboard. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk to you guys today about. I was happy uh, when uh, Tim asked me to come talk to you, and I asked, "Well, what do you want me to speak about?" He said, "He he replied. He said, I'm interested in your take on honeybee nutrition, and just just your perspective on on farming and how it's interacting, how bees are interacting with." With farming nowadays and I truly feel that nutrition is our industry's number one issue right now. I truly feel a lot of our problems happening right now um, with our bees is because of nutri nutritional problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush up a little bit on honeybee nutrition. Uh, I won't get too in-depth on it just to just speak a little bit on it, strictly from a beekeeper's perspective. And I'll be speaking about um, our changing landscape and its effect on, um, on nutrition. And I'll be speaking on it from a beekeeper's perspective and a grain farmer, or grain farmers. I always brush up a little bit about the initiatives working to address the loss of biodiversity and specifically what we can do as beekeepers to address the issue. And throughout, um, I always like interaction from the crowd. Um, if you guys have anything to say or comment, just blurt it out. And I, I feel that uh, it makes more of a conversation of this and we can extract some. I, <laughs> I went to the, the BC Honey Producers Association meeting last year and as I told them, they said I'd never gone to a convention or any meeting thinking, oh, you know, Ian Stepler's going to be there, I better show up. I've never done that. I've always gone to these meetings or conventions or whatever because I want to talk to the beekeepers in the crowd. It's, it's all about the discussion in the crowd. We're just the sideshow up here just spurring on the conversation. So, so don't hesitate to uh, speak up and just add some comments. So anybody who doesn't know me, um, Ian Stepler, I've located a farm around Miami. <clears throat> I'm married to Sandy and I have a family of five. I took a diploma of agriculture, and like Tim was saying, this is where I got my uh, introduction to beekeeping. So beekeeping is fresh in our family. Um, I'm a director on the MBA, and I'm the owner manager, 
manager and president of the farm. So we, we have a, uh, a grain farm, 3,500 acre grain farm. Uh, we raise 500 purebred Charlie cattle. And I brought the apiary in and we've grown to 1,200 hives right now. And I'm the farm apiarist. So I'll start the talk out a little bit speaking on healthy bees. And why does it matter? Why does healthy bees matter? Well, healthy bees matter because that's, that's, healthy bees means more honey, and more honey means more money, right? And just like my old man always says, that's the bottom line. Everything we do is focused around more money. So we're going to be focusing on the health of the bees. We're focusing on the, uh, the hive's diet, the bees' diet. And pollen, as we all know, pollen is our hive's primary source of nutrition. Okay? We can't substitute pollen uh, with other, any other feed. Bees need pollen to be able to survive. It's, full of, it's kind of like a superfood. It's full of proteins, uh, complex fats, lipids, sterols, minerals, all the micronutrients. And every pollen source has a different nutritional value. <coughs> So I'm not going to speak too in-depth on this, but I want to use this to kind of prove a point throughout what I'm talking here. This is DeGroote's ratio of essential amino acids. And he's developed a ratio on the, uh, is the essential proteins within the, the bees' feed, all based on tryptophan as a as the ratio. So tryptophan is the first limiting uh, uh, protein within that feed. That means, let's say, the isoleucine up here at four, the ratio one tryptophan to four isoleucine within that feed source to make a balanced profile for your for bees. If this isoleucine comes down to three, that teeters a whole balance off within the feed, and they waste a lot of protein within that feed, if you follow me on that. And this is extremely important to have a balanced food source for our hives, the source of our feed has to be balanced, the protein profile has to be balanced. So I'm, I'm looking at this and I understand it, I'm, and I'm looking at all these pollen analysis and I'm trying to make sense of it all. And I'm trying to make my own supplement, and I'm trying to mix things together and trying to figure out if it's balanced or not. And I'm noticing while tryptophan is lacking in most of these uh, uh, nutritional analysis, and it's because it takes an extra step to, to find that value of tryptophan. So I, I emailed Randy and said, Randy, what am I going to do? I, I can't figure out my, my, uh, my nutritional values of my feed sources or pollens because they're always lacking tryptophan. What am I supposed to do? And he says, well, Ian, it's, it's a ratio. Just think outside the box. And he said, let's use uh, histidine, he figured. He says, well, we'll use histidine as the first limiting because it's the most consistent in most of the feeds. And he reworked the ratio for me. He said, here, use this. So this is basically what I use now when I'm looking at my pollen analysis. It lacks tryptophan, I use histidine as the first limiting. So with that, you have, and you guys won't be able to read this at all, but this is a table of all the pollens that the bees feed on throughout the year, okay? It has all the proteins and the analysis and all the different essential amino acids here, all the different values and with that ratio, we can determine whether or not these pollens are nutritious or not. Is okay. that based on your area? This is based on who knows. This is it's a lot. I, I, it's very frustrating. I find very little information behind all this. I know. I mean, either. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at uh, analyses that are 50 years old from different parts of the country. <laughs> can, you, can you email that to me if I give you my email address later? Yes, I can get that to you for sure. And. Uh, it tells you uh, your balanced profile for the bees here, but these are all individual values throughout the chart. And what this tells me using that uh, DeGroote's uh, uh, ratio is poplar and willow and apple and clover and canola and alfalfa are all terrific feeds for the bees because it's well balanced. And the bees do very well on that. But this table also shows us that sunflower and dandelion and buckwheat and blueberry, they're all they're lacking. They're not, the, the protein profile isn't there. And I look at that and I, I'm thinking to myself, dandelion. 
I'm thinking dandelion, what's this all about? Because usually in the spring in May, I focus all my clean work around dandelion. Like the dandelion comes out, my hives just explode in growth. And my bees don't, that's the best time to build queens, is right when that dandelion flow is, right? So I'm thinking, this, what's going on here? But what's, what's happening? Can I ask a question? I know I've interrupted you talking about time already. What's your thoughts on uh, Karagana? Uh, I don't think Karagana is listed there. I noticed. But it, uh, and I'll get into it just a little bit here. Karagana is within that mix. In a balance or non-balance? I'm not sure about that. I haven't actually <laughs> you know, the seen reason, that. The reason I ask is because I keep uh, some eyes on a site that has a tremendous amount of um, Karagana, and they do fantastic. And then I keep uh, a site where there's not so much Karagana, but a lot more pussy with those. And again, I don't see a difference in either one. I yeah. want to know if you knew anything about the father tradition of Karagana. And what's going on is the diversity. There's likely a diversity of flowers within the area anyways. Oh, right? for sure. Diversity is key. Like you look at your pollen frame um, in the spring, and there isn't just one color of pollen in there. The bees are bringing in a variety of pollens from all different floral sources. So even though dandelion maybe is lacking in, that, I forget what uh, essential there, but it's lacking in one or two of them actually, they're bringing in other pollens to make up for that deficit, right? So they're bringing in this massive <clears throat> amount of crude protein into the hive and they're able to utilize it because they're bringing in these other bits of highly nutritious pollens from other places in the area. So diversity for our bees is extremely important. So they go, they're going around and they're picking up all this dandelion and they're bringing all this protein into the hive which they build their bees on but at the same time they're back here in the apple trees and they're bringing back that really rich stuff and they're mixing it together and it's just like when I'm filling my dinner plate right? <laughs> I'm putting meat and I'm putting, putting potatoes on there and my wife's always putting the vegetables on <laughs> she's balancing out my diet for me right <laughs> this is exactly the same thing the bees are doing is they're bringing in the, the whole amount, amount of pollen into your hive <clears throat> And then they're they're mixing it together and they're utilizing all the all that very important and very valuable protein to build their their hives in. So this is like um, good I'm just walking through a year, and we're just about to walk into the dearth of winter. It usually starts November. I think this year is going to start in October. <laughs> it feels like it. So we're going to walk through October, November, December, January, February, and March, and I'll talk about that just a little bit later. We're going to get into April. So I'm putting my bees out in March, and I'm usually stimulating them with a bit of protein just to get them going, feeding them some syrup. But that's when the poplar starts coming out. Okay, poplar is really rich, apparently really rich uh, pollen, and it comes with nectar too. And then you get the willow, and the wild plum, and the maple. And they're using all that pollen and they're mixing it together to create this terrific feed. And this is a very important time for the bees, is in that first early pollen flow when the bees come out of winter, they come out of the shed confinement, they're holding on to their winter nest, they're old bees, right? These are really old bees. And they gotta flip themselves into the springtime nest. They gotta build that spring nest. And they do that by mining out the resources within themselves and with the richness of the resources within the area. So they're building their, their spring nest. So after they figure that out, then you hit May, and there's a big glut of dandelion pulling hit there. But Mother Nature's got to figure it out with Saskatoon, and apple, and pears, and choke cherries, and hawthorns. And this is the time of the year when the bees are in extreme growth, right? They're just in tremendous growth mode. So they've already switched themselves into spring and now they're wanting to multiply, now they want to duplicate. And the Mother Nature matches it up beautifully with this huge abundance of pollen. So they have all this resource and they, they build up and hope, this is usually when they want to swarm because there's so much resource, they're growing, they're in the spirit of building. And this is when they, that's when Mother Nature lines everything up in a tremendous growth period. And then you get your clover and your canola and your sunflower. <clears throat> so this, this uh, beehive has grown into tremendous strength in the spring, 
Now it's this huge hive coming into summer, and it utilizes all this availability. And Mother Nature just lined everything up just so perfectly. She's lined the farmer up right in July. This is right about the time when uh, those hives are at their max. So we're able to utilize tremendous honey crops. And then you get into the fall flows of alfalfa. It's <clears throat> very important in the fall with goldenrod, some other wildflowers. So if you look at this, she's pretty much Mother Nature's Pretty much all the holes are filled up. There might be just a little bit of a, June, a dearth in June. This year we didn't have one, but some years that's three weeks, so we spend a little bit of attention in that June dearth. Sometimes it doesn't matter because there's so much reserve in the hives anyways, right? So she's got this whole map figured out. <clears throat> we need a healthy environment to make that whole equation work. Why does that matter? It's because a healthy environment means lots of flowers, like I showed you. And lots of flowers mean healthy bees. And healthy bees mean more honey, and more honey means more money. And just like my old man says, that's the bottom line, right? <laughs> more money, that's what, we're, that's what we have to focus on. So this is a really interesting graph, and I just love talking about this. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this graph. Uh, Lloyd Harris is here tonight. He did a study a number of years ago on the age of bees throughout the year. And Randy, Randy Oliver had put it together into a nice, neat, tidy little graph here. And I just love this graph. It shows you, wish I, it shows you uh, the size of the hive. So here's about 20,000 bees here. This is the size of your winter nest. Flipping down into your springtime turnover, and then that tremendous growth throughout the summer. And then uh, she, and right about now, we're in October here, their bird my hives are done burning. They've been done burning for a long time. But the brood nest tapers off as they build up that winter nest, right? So to get to these flowers, these lucrative flowers from the farmer, these hives, we want to time that perfectly. So they're up over 50,000, this says over 50,000 bees in my colony. We want this colony to be built up at that size to capitalize on that flower, right? That's, that's the objective, that's what we try to do. But agriculture's changed, and it's been changing over the last 50 years, but I'm, I'm more so speaking about it's changed over the last 10 years. And the reason it's changing is because the amount of investment that's going into agriculture right now, just a tremendous amount of investment. There's technology available that just baffles me. Like it's, it's, you notice all the farmers are driving straight lines now? Mm. <laughs> it's because of the GPS technology, something that we would not even have thought about 20 years ago. Uh, the efficiencies are just terrific. Our machinery, getting bigger and better. We're able to cover more acres in a less amount of time and doing a better job at it. So this is allowing farmers to farm better. Okay. And it's changed the landscape. And this is the reason why your hives are, near, are malnourished. This is the exact reason. It's not the GM technology. And it's not the Roundup that's killing the bees. It's the technology of the GM and the Roundup as creating a landscape that has nothing but crop growing right now. We've lost our diversity, completely lost our diversity. And we farm 3,500 acres of land, and we employ every bit of technology that's available to us right now. Like, we use it all. My brother manages the grain farm. And even I, if I'm looking at this field, I'm thinking that is absolutely brilliant. That is something else. There isn't a single mistake in that field. Pardon me? This one is maybe blooming this a little early. <laughs> but that's amazing, isn't it? Like, look at that field, it's absolutely brilliant. There isn't a single weed in that field. Like my brother calls them weeds, but I call them beefy, right? Before, when I got out of uh, high school, I remember very distinctly uh, combining for my dad. And I was in the combine, 
and this is before we started using ground diverting te technology. And we had to get out of the combine every second row because of the thistles on the radiator. Mm -hmm. to overheat the combine. And this is before we got into bees. And right now, I'm thinking back at that time, I'm thinking, those beekeepers would have made a mint on that field. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. There would have been flowers right from the beginning. Dad's fields were dirty. It would have had honey right from the beginning, right till fall. But not here. We only have, this flower is very lucrative to us, but this gives us three weeks. We need more than three weeks, right? GPS precision. Every crop, yeah. yeah every crop so yeah, you don't have very much push line or spot line in that area. We do have, and we're losing it. Yeah. And that's one of my main focuses. That's one of my main talking points. Is we're losing the trees. Mm -hmm. We're losing the wetlands. We're we're losing. Uh, farmers are becoming too focused on managing that piece of property that we're trying to farm everything, and for a lot of reasons. Land prices are expensive and unproductive areas, which we're not getting the return out of. We have to improve that to be able to get our investment back on that. There's a lot of things adding up to taxes. A farmer, the worst thing for a farmer is having a piece of unproductive land taxed. So he's looking at that three acres thinking, that's costing me money. So I'm going to fix that up so that it can look like this part of the field here. Right? There's a lot of things like that. Precision farming. Still about my brother Jeff, he flies for Air Canada, and uh, he's kind of the tech guy of the farm. So he's bringing in all this technology. And he's allowing us to almost, in a sense, micromanage our fields. There isn't a time in history where we've paid more attention to the individual plant than there is now. Grandpa used to go to the bag of seed, throw the bag of seed out, and then he used to go out and collect the harvester. Now we are managing our crop paying attention to every single one of these plants in their field. It's like we're taking, we're seeding their fields, it's like we're taking individual seeds and putting them in the ground like that. And then with the sprayer, and thanks to chemical farming, this is our sprayer. It's a 120 foot boom, uh, John Deere 40, 49, 40. But it's, it's the most important piece of machinery on our farm right now. We control all the conditions of our crops with this machine. We go over it before we, we grow our crop, and then let's say uh, uh, the weeds would take some yield, and then uh, it rain too much, so then we get some root rot, and then as it's trying to grow, we get uh, some fungal infection, and, and insects would come in, and we try to harvest it, and we're too late, and the crop, or the weather takes the crop, so we lose quality, so we end up with uh, taking uh, the return a lower return. Nowadays, with this sprayer, we're able to control our conditions. We grow the crop, the weeds can't take it. The root drop doesn't take it because of our, our seed treatments. The, uh, the fungal infection we spray for, the bugs we can take care of. And we have the facility now that we can bring in the crop a lot more efficiently. So we're able to capitalize on a more consistent yield every year, thanks to this machine. It's extremely important to grain farmers, and this is why we use it. We're using larger equipment, more horsepower. It's absolutely amazing. This is a zero-till drill. There's Adam. <clears throat> He's uh, seeding wheat in this picture here. But this machine, it will, it's like I was saying, it's like you take an individual seed and you're putting it in the ground, just like you're growing a garden. And then we side band it with the exact amount of fertilizer we need to grow that crop. And we're doing it at five and a half miles an hour, 45 feet wide. Right? So this is absolutely brilliant. And then when harvest comes along, we start harvesting the field. And we, if one combine is not getting the work done, we just layer the second combine. And we have the third combine. And because of that, we don't want to have corners. We don't want tree rows. And we don't want these little dips in the field and all this. We want to go. When you watch a harvest field work, you want to go up and down. That's the most efficient. And the grain cart is chasing them all the time. And you're getting things done so efficiently, it's really fun to be a part of. Yeah. What about um, bumpers on the ditches? 
how close to the ditch do you guys want? And farmers are pretty much pushing the limits right up onto the road well, in some places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, I mean... Like, Dwayne, was it Minnesota? Yeah, Minnesota, I believe, maybe five years ago, enacted a, a law to, I think it's a 60-foot allowance from the road or the ditch. There you can't cultivate. There is a minimum, a certain uh, you got to do for fertilizer as well. And I know specifically for safety reasons, because what's going on around our area where the farmers are creeping up to the road is we're growing corn, and you know, corn can be 12, 15 feet tall. You're coming up to uncontrolled intersections that you can't see until you actually get there. And farmers, when they get busy, they get narrow tunnel vision and, and drive fast. Sometimes the cell phone's out and there's people being killed because of these uncontrolled intersections and poor visibility. That's one of the reasons well, why. Well, that's also an impact on the person, yes, because you, know, you, yes. you don't have anything else growing in those ditches. And if it could get the arms to quit spraying conditions, ditches, that would be, yeah, that, that, too. that would help too. Mm -hmm. But these, the, our ability to clear and, oh, that's me, sorry. That's probably my brother. Yeah. I kind of just left the farm. They don't know I'm here. <laughs> sneaking back in. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this weather's really turned our farm on its head. We've been, we have, after the terrific summer we've had, we didn't expect this kind of October. We're just kind of all this work and we can't get it done. And we're just so I just kind of snuck away today. <laughs> Jumped in the yes, David. When somebody asks a question, would you repeat the questions so you can't hear the questions back here? Well, that's a good idea. I'll do that from now on. Um, so our ability to clear and flatten and drain land is better than we've ever been able to do it. <clears throat> we can buy one of these high hose for $50,000 and just go in and just clear two acres of land a day. Like it used to take ground but two a, a year to clear two acres, you know, with those old detractors and dynamite. And they used to clear the land. And now, and it's getting to the point where these farmers, and my brother included, is very uh, perfectionist. The worst thing is a perfectionist farmer, because these guys are getting to the point they're pulling trees and they're shaking them, and they're actually stacking these trees neatly into this burning pile. They're just pushing them into the pile and burning them. They have to do it nice and neat. You know, everything's just perfect, right? Which is fine. But our landscape is changing. It's completely becoming dedicated to crop. And in a sense, our, in a sense, agriculture has progressed, and honeybees have kind of been forgotten about. All this investment has been poured into farmers' pockets, but everybody's forgot about the beekeeper. Like, what about us? We're part of the equation too, right? We're here, and everything that's happening on the landscape directly affects us. This field looks absolutely brilliant to me. It's a beautiful canola field. I, I can look at that and I'm thinking, I'm going to make a lot of honey off that field. But it only lasts for three weeks, four weeks at the most. What about the rest of the time? We've got to get the bees to that field, right? So if you look at that same uh, calendar, okay, we're losing our trees, so we have a little bit of poplar. You've got to remember, this is when the bees, a very important time, arguably one of the most important times in a honeybee hive is in April when they're rejuvenating that, rejuvenating that winter nest into a summer, into a spring nest, right? So we need lots of resources. So we're losing our trees, so we have a little poplar going. <clears throat> and where's the willows and well, plum and maple? So these bees are coming out of winter. And all they, they're using the resources within their bodies to build this next nest. And they need the resources out to help them fortify that nest, to be able to build those bees but they're lacking the pollen to be able to do that. So then they go into May and there's a bit of dandelion there. Some of it doesn't spray their yards into some Saskatoon and you just notice there's not a lot of resource for them to, to build in May. <clears throat> so if they get their hive built in April, they can't build up to actually do anything to grow in May. And then summer comes, and it's pretty much the same, except the clover is hardly there. But the farmer's there. Farmer turns out big. So you have this huge crop that comes out in the middle of summer. And then the year will probably end off with a little bit of weeds around the edge. Hmm. 
So this is a very typical story I hear from beekeepers. Their hive looks great all winter, it comes out of winter, and it just kind of staggers, right? If not dwindles. And then it kind of struggles all the way through May. It's not growing. It can't do anything. It can't progress. And then they get it into June, and all of a sudden they say, oh, my hive looks great again. And that hive's building. And then they're saying they got the boxes on their hives, but there's not any honey going up top. Why aren't they putting honey in my boxes? The hive looks great. Well, all the growth that they should have been spent here is now spent here because they're finally being nourished. They're finally being able to grow and develop themselves. So they get themselves to the end of the canola flow here, and they just starting to bring that nectar in. All right, here comes some nectar, and then the canola ends. Right? So they missed the flow. And if it's anything like this year, where we didn't have any nectar all August, they're having to feed their bees all through August. Instead of, you know, if you have a good August, maybe they can capture some of this late flow. Yes, when I first got into the business, I remember coming to the Manitoba Honey, or Manitoba Beekeepers Association. I always, when I first got into beekeeping, it's very important, I always found it very important to go to these conventions just because you made connections with other beekeepers. Very important. And this is what I did every year. I went to the convention, and I remember sitting down, and there's this older beekeeper just talking to everybody he could. And he come and sat down at the table with me, and he said, you know, July will make and break a beekeeper. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't know what he meant at that time. It wasn't until just like five or six years ago, I actually understand what he means. Is July is always, you got your glut of honey in July, get your hives ready so you can capitalize it right off the start. Because if you miss July and you fall into an August like this year, you got nothing, right? So always make sure you bring in that July honey because you never know if that August one's going to materialize for you. So that is what he's talking about. And like any other animals, malnourished animals is sickly. You know, I can look at a cow and I can tell if it's malnourished just by the way they look, right? Our animals don't look like that, but let's say one of my neighbors do. And <laughs> <laughs> that animal is going to fall from infection and possibly die. When you look at that bee, we can't tell if that bee's malnourished or not. If that bee's malnourished, it's going to fall into from infection from parasites, there's influences of chemical exposures, uh, viral infections, fungal infections, weather, winter, all these stress-related events will influence that bee, and if it's not, if the nourishment isn't adequate, that bee's going to die, just like that cow. It's the same thing, just we can't see the malnourishment in that bee. And we are creating an imbalance across our landscape, but we as farmers are just doing our job. Okay? We're feeding the world. We all have to eat. It's very important. We have to eat. And we have to realize that this is a business that we're running. Dollars and cents. It dictates the day. It always does. It always has, always does. And society is driven this direction. We want cheap, abundant, high quality food, right? So this is the system we've set up. So my dilemma as a farmer beekeeper is uh, <clears throat> on the farm. My bees need space. They need the diversity of flowering plants. My brother calls them weeds. My bees need nature to exist, uh, to sustain and maintain, maintain their colony growth. They need a little bit of a break from this continual exposure from chemicals. And my bees need the farmers to make money so they keep growing those flowers. So if they don't make money on the flowers, they'll grow something else, like soybeans, and we don't make any money on that. But our farm, we need to adopt the latest tech to glean the efficiencies, like Roundup Ready technology. Uh, we need to control the weeds, diseases, all the insects. We need to control all those variables. And we need to control the noxious weeds around the edges, like in the ditches, and that's where the ditch spring comes. Farmers are very particular about spring ditches, just because of that. Farm needs to utilize the land, and we need to improve the soils. We need to increase <coughs> revenues uh, across the acres. 
cost of lands going up, land taxes. But we need to find a balance, a working balance. And bee, beekeepers need to understand the, the need to farm. But farmers have to understand that nature must exist at the same time. Okay. So what's actually being done right now to address this problem? And there's a few initiatives going. <clears throat> Initiatives like a governmental initiative, like Manitoba Forage and Beef initiatives, is like a is a collaboration of Manitoba agriculture, uh, Manitoba beef producers, Ducks Unlimited, uh, Manitoba Forage and Grassland Associations. And so these uh, stakeholders coming together, and they're primarily focused on the cattle, they're just trying to utilize the grass better and how to manage the grass better and how to uh, manage these sensitive lands so they're not destroyed with grazing and all this. But at the same time, they've included pollinator habitat and preservation. I find this very interesting, because this is what we do in our farm. <clears throat> this is a picture of our pasture, and you'll notice a lot of grass, and you'll notice clover spread out through. There's not enough clover there to grow, like to produce a honey crop. But my objective is to just to provide a little bit of flowers to provide my bees nourishment. Right? So we want the grasses, and we just sprinkle a little bit of clover, just to give something for the bees and everything else living, something to forage on. And what we actually do is very interesting. We rotate our cattle through these paddocks, and the cattle will come in, they'll eat the grass first every time, they'll eat the grass right down, and then they come to the clovers after, and they'll start gnawing down the clovers, <clears throat> and then we rotate them to another pad a paddock. And every time the cattle chew down the clovers, it just kind of rejuvenates the, uh, the, the clover plant once it uh, regenerate itself. So I have a continual bloom all through my pastures all year as he rotates through, because these clover plants keep bringing me back fresh flowers all year. And this has provided a, a huge resource to my farm, just providing it. And clovers are real rich, well-balanced pollen, and it just provides the nourishment they need just to keep going through the year. Uh, there's companies like Syngenta is providing like a pollinator seed mix for farmers like ourselves who are proactive and identify this as a concern. We can, when we're establishing pasture, <clears throat> we established them. We bought seed from Syngenta and it's just a mixture of clovers and other flower type plants. Just sprinkle it through the whole mix so the whole pasture, instead of just being grass, now we have some flowers actually growing. And general mills, like, and corporations, whether they're investing money into, they're actually investing money into this project just trying to figure out how to establish a flower within that grass, like grass sods in, it's very hard to grow, to establish new plants in that. And they're just doing some research on how to actually achieve that. So we have private investment uh, being put into this also. I don't know if any of you have heard of the ALICE project but it's the land use, alternative land use services. And it's kind of this flagship for sustainable land development. And they basically, they're focusing on uh, clean air, clean water, carbon sequestering, erosion, all those types. But they're also including pollinator support and wildlife habitat, and that's where we come in. So Alice is like a farmer delivered program it's a collaboration of farmers. They could focus mainly on farmers because they're the stewards of our land. They're the ones we're focusing. Was the collaboration with the farmers, municipalities, uh, through conservation groups, farm associations, government agencies. So it's, it's using all the stakeholders to uh, drive this program forward. And they're focusing on, this is the point which I really agree on, they're focusing on uh, the marginal and equal sensitive parcels of land. <clears throat> they're not telling the farmer to farm that piece of property different. They're saying, you guys farm your land. We recognize that you guys have to farm your land. But everything else around the edges, maybe let's, let's uh, preserve. Let's maybe focus on trying to um, reinstate natural places, you know, the wetlands. Um, watersheds, natural bush, uh, 
they're looking at ditches. Ditches is a no-brainer to me. Like, we have a grid all the way down our countryside that the farmers don't need to use. And the municipalities don't have to spray so intensively where we can grow flowers and provide flower nourishment for our, our, our bees or other, other insects right across the countryside. It's a no-brainer to me. Well, and, and let's say they stop spraying. <coughs> and there was some noxious weed growth. What's the financial impact on a farm of your size if you're dealing with that? Oh, I'm so glad you said that. <clears throat> and this is what I tell farmers all the time. I'm saying the attention on our ditches were such before because those ditches polluted our fields. And we had a hard time keeping ahead of the weeds. But now we have the technology available, it doesn't matter anymore to them because they have so many tools in their toolkit, they can keep their fields clean. At the same time, um, they got, I'm a, you know, a great farmer as well. Um, in my area of the country, they don't spend as much uh, time or attention on the ditches as they should. And we have trees growing inside the ditches where we have a drainage. And we get flooded lands and flooded crops up. So yeah. it's a two-fold or two-sided sword, right? But we so, can be creative about oh, it, Oh, right? we, we definitely can. I, yeah, I, we I, don't I agree have... that we shouldn't spray our ditches, but at the same time, I think our municipalities and our governments should definitely look at better care of the ditches because I we cut our ditches and I got tons of sweet clover growing in the ditches and I wait for the sweet clover to just fall onto the verge of uh, finishing up and I go cut it all down and I'll grow it right back. And I it's agree beautiful. with you too. I, I love it. But, but I think I we, we need to be more creative. I talked to my municipality and I, I've requested not to spray the ditches. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how come you, I understand that we have to control these noxious weeds. It's very important. I completely understand that, control and brush. So I said, you, you're spraying down that ditch and there's nothing there to kill but my all my nice flowers. Turn it off. And then there's the noxious weed. I said, get that double shot if you want. I don't care, just leave my flowers alone. Focus on the bushes. And, but they say, no, we can't do that because we're, we're paying them by the mile. And the guy in the truck is probably 18 years old and he doesn't know the difference between clover and leafy spurge, right? So what do you, so the easiest solution is just to broadcast everything and kill everything, yeah, right? I mean, they can also mow. And they can mow, and mowing, I... And I find the funny <coughs> thing is that they, they go and mow at the end of summer when everything is dead already. I mean, that's not when we're getting, we need to drain our fields in the middle of summer too, right? So let's cut twice a year. Yeah, and year. mowing is actually beneficial to us because just like alfalfa, you want that alfalfa alfa plant <coughs> rejuvenated. This is a benefit to us, and our clovers too. You mow it down, you control what you need, and uh, all this plant comes back for our bees to th thrive on. We're not killing it with sprays and such, right? So we need to be creative, that's my point. We do uh, starting in July, yes. Yeah. And it's market driven. I'll just quickly go through. Um, there's it's, uh, Alice is geared so that uh, uh, citizens and corporations, philanthropists, can directly invest into all these areas within the landscape which they want preserved. You see a class three wetland that's probably going to be drained. That's an important piece of property. That's an important wetland. They invest that money into that sensitive piece of property and the farmer gets financial benefit from that. So then he leaves it alone. So just kind of a monetary uh, and there's one going on in Manitoba right now uh, in Little Saskatchewan Conservation District. The second year it's been in operation and it's been successful so far. <coughs> Other initiatives like uh, our government right now is putting some attention towards this. Uh, they're investing into wetland restoration and projects, uh, riparian area enhancements, um, land rehabilitation, tree plantings, this is all good for, for beekeepers. And industry investment. We look at Bayer and Monsanto and Syngenta as the enemy. And very easily we look at these corporations, agribusiness as causing us the trouble. But at the same time, 
and I'm, I'm speaking about agribusiness putting so much money into agriculture and allowing agriculture to progress at the same time they forgot about beekeepers. My message to agribusiness is we're here too. Invest into us too. Solve our problems so we don't become your problem. And they're listening. They're, they've, uh, Bayer has like a bee care division and they're more so testing their own chemicals and how it influences uh, uh, insects. Monsanto has a bee health center. They're actually developing a, uh, a varroa mite uh, treatment <clears throat> that we can use. Instead of using chemicals, it's an RNA interference treatment. Syngenta has made that pollinator seed mix. Actually, Monsanto is also, I was talking to the lead on the Monsanto Bee Health Division, and he's talking about using uh, field mappings. And he's using this technology, mappings of fields, and he's trying to create a program where he can show the farmer you have your square field at the 10 acre in the corner you're putting all the money into all the time. You're losing money on that. You keep farming it, but you're losing money there. So if you're going to lose money, why not put it down to something like forage and make some money on it? Or if it's losing you money, don't do anything to it. Just allow pollinator plants to grow and benefit nature. Just get back a little bit. So they're putting attention towards this, and I think that is extremely positive, and I feel we need to support that. I know it's hard as a beekeeper to maybe say that, but at the same time, we have to, we have to fight and we struggle, we have to keep our bees healthy and alive, we have to progress. Agriculture is not changing here. We have to almost, in a sense, catch up to it if we want to keep our businesses profitable. So what can we do as beekeepers? How much time do I have, Tim? About seven minutes. Okay, I can do that. We can feed our bees. <clears throat> and we want to be able to maintain our colony growth throughout the pollen births. That's extreme, extremely important. And then we're going to focus on two important times through the year. The first time is during the spring growth. <clears throat> Our hives are coming out of winter as old bees. They, are, they extract all the proteins and fats to reestablish that spring nest during in this period of time here. Extremely risky, extremely critical. They use all the pollen and resources in the environment to build that nest into spring. So this is a switchover. I call it the switchover, right? That the colony is switching from winter into spring, right? Extremely critical time for the bees. This is when we have to ensure these hives are properly fed so they can progress themselves fully from winter into spring. Here's one of my pollen or uh, one of my uh, brood frames <clears throat> in the spring. It's just an absolutely brilliant frame of bees and brood, but there's something wrong with that frame. So there's no pollen in there. They're working hand to mouth. This is back in 2015. There's pollen coming in, a steady stream of pollen. And that queen is building a tremendous nest right now. She has like four or five frames of active brood going on. But she's living right on the edge. That, that nest, later on, went into a week and a half dearth because we had a very severe winter storm come in the middle of May. It was right before I started to bleed my eyes. These colonies were like six to eight frames of brood, growing like crazy. I remember a week and a half before that, I was actually putting protein patties on these colonies. <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, I'm seeing the pollen coming in, and I'm thinking, am I wasting my time and money here? Because these colonies look absolutely terrific in this great weather, and these colonies are growing, and I'm here I'm putting supplement on and spending money on them. And they were just nibbling at the patties. They weren't paying much attention to it. Until the storm came, I didn't see it coming two days ahead of me. So I wouldn't have had time to go around to feed all these bees. But this storm hit, and within the week, they ate that two-pound patty just like that. And they turned it straight into brood. Because what will happen if this nest, this is a lot of resource. This is a lot of, they need a, a lot of resource to keep that brood going, to have it fully developed. And if this is all they have to feed on, when all of a sudden that pollen stops coming into the nest, they'll cannibalize those bees just like that. You won't even see it happen so quick. 
And what they do is they'll pull back the protein out of, those, out of that brood until they find that balance, which can move forward. And it's usually not good. They pull right back. And we don't want that to happen. So what we want to do is we want to make sure these bees are well fed all through the spring. If something like this happens, or if let's say a four day rain event comes through, we've got to make sure they have enough pollen stores inside this nest to be able to get them through those times of dearth. And if they don't have that, we gotta make sure they have it in supplement. So I use supplement just just as a just to supplement the pollen. I'm not trying to replace the pollen. The pollen is essential. It's just the supplement helps fill in the spaces when when it's lacking. So there's many different types of uh, protein patties on the market, and I'm not going to sell any here, but uh, talk to Mike, he can talk to you about it. <laughs> but what I uh, used to do, and I might start again, is make my own patty. And what I, and I'll just show you a simple recipe, and the bees absolutely love this recipe. It's very simple and cheap. But I use brewer's yeast. Brewer's yeast is a balanced protein for profile for the bees. But the bees don't like brewer's yeast, but they love soy flour. But soy flour is an unbalanced uh, feed source. So I mix the two together. The soy flour is a bit cheaper. And I put some dried egg in there just for the fats, just trying to get fats and cholesterol. And pollen just to attract the bees to the patty itself. But I've actually taken the, the pollen out. So the pollen that I've been buying in to mix into the patties comes from China. And if you know, think about China, it's probably full of heavy metals, right? <laughs> so I've taken all the pollen out because I don't want to give them the bad stuff we don't want in there. Uh, the lemon juice I just used to adjust the uh, pH and the canola oil just to bump the fats a bit. <clears throat> I found the important part was uh, corn syrup. I used high fructose corn syrup and I used it instead of sucrose. Sucrose will dry your patio into this brick. The bees can't access for it. Corn syrup is hygroscopic, and it uh, absorbs moisture, so it'll stay, stay soft a lot longer. That's what I used, the bees just absolutely loved it. So then what you'll get is little bees nibbling on your patio like that. And that's, and this, that makes me so happy to see that. Just your little mandibles going, just devouring that patty. And you know they're using it when they're actually ingesting it. So this is going straight down into the, uh, the brood nest. <clears throat> the second most important is the second important time of the uh, of feeding your nest is in the fall <clears throat> when they're developing that uh, winter nest. We want to make sure these winter bees are well fed. We want to make sure they have the, the proper fat stores in their bodies. Uh, to be able to take their, their colony through the massive dearth of winter into spring. Usually about this time, August, September, you know, <laughs> farmer's fields, they're usually harvesting. There's not a lot there. The ditches have all been sprayed. So you have to find pollen. So you gotta get your bees in an area where there is pollen. And then, and then uh, bump them up with a little bit of supplement just to make sure that they got what they need. And this picture is a little bit of an exaggeration. But this is a uh, picture of a forager bee. All the fats and proteins have been mined out of her already, so she's expendable. She's out collecting the resources. This is a winter bee. And she is full of the, the richness. And this is what gets them through winter. So this is what we want to make sure our bees go into winter looking like. Like fat and full of stores. And you tip your colonies back in fall and you're hoping to see brilliant nests like that, which will carry you through. So that brings me to the end, and I appreciate your attention. <laughs> so any questions, uh, don't hesitate.